Good morning. Well, it looks like we're in our seventh or eighth week, I think, of uh, uh, doing this type of uh, worship service. Um, I just went back and counted, and I think this is my seventh video sermon, not counting uh, Good Friday, and I think we did at least one or two before that as a um, text devotional. So we've been at this for a little while now, and I've been noticing listening to people talk um, both on TV and also uh, out in the community um, that they're starting to get a little bit antsy, uh, starting to feel like we need to move on. What's the next step? Um, we've been in this uh, lockdown or this quarantine or this semi-quarantine state for a while now, and, and uh, we need to we need to move on to the next step. So I kind of wanted to address that a little bit this morning. Um, at least from the perspective of the church, and uh, hopefully give you some uh, things to think about uh, as we move forward. I never played organized football when I was a kid, but I've seen enough of it to know that it's possible to get physically hurt pretty easily. Uh, I remember one of the boys in our scout troop several years ago, his name was George, and he thought he had a real chance at playing professional football. Uh, now, keep in mind, he was only in middle school. He only weighed about 110 pounds. Um, so he really hadn't experienced any serious football yet, but he was fast. And he thought because he was fast that he would make a pretty good receiver uh, and he'd be able to, to play professional football. And I remember telling him, George, you are definitely fast. But if any of those linebackers ever catch you, you're not going to be much more than a grease spot out in the middle of that football field. Uh, there's not going to be much left of you. Al Hamilton was a missionary that I knew many years ago. He was the one that started Pioneer Bible Translators, which is the group that Joni and Jim Bliffin worked through in Papua New Guinea. And many years ago, when he was doing a revival for our church in Indiana, Al was telling about his high school football career. And for the vast majority of it, he sat on the sidelines because he was a beanpole. Even uh, uh, later in life, he wasn't very heavy. He was about six foot tall, a little more than six foot tall, and he only weighed about 120 pounds in high school. And the coach knew that if he ever put him out there on the field, there's a good chance he was going to get hurt. And so he kept him on the sidelines. But one day, one game, uh, it was Al's senior year of school. It may have been the last year or the last game of the season, and he begged the coach, said, put me in, coach, put me in, I, I, I want to play. And so the coach put him in. He was only in one play, and they had to carry him out on a stretcher after that play. But as they were carrying him out, he looked over the coach, he said, thanks, coach. <laughs> in serious football, you're going to get knocked down. But there's one basic element that's the key to victory. And that is when you get knocked down, whether you get knocked down by a block or a tackle, you got to get back up. You have to get back up and continue the game. And no matter what level of football you play, whether it's midget league or uh, neighborhood ball or high school or college or even semi-pro ball or, or pro ball, you're going to get knocked down. And if you want to stay in the game, you have to get back up. But you know, you don't have to play football to get knocked down. Circumstances in life sometimes will knock us down, and sometimes it happens quite often. Could be an accident, could be an illness, could be a, a conflict at work, it could be financial difficulties, and several people are experiencing that now. It could be broken relationships, it could be grief over someone who's died, it could be depression. All sorts of challenges of every description will knock us down. So as a Christian, how do we deal with being knocked down? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 says, We live by faith, not by sight. And that's who we are as believers. We are faith walkers. Now, does that mean that we'll never get walk or knocked down? No, of course not. It just means we have God to help us get back up. You ever watched a, a football game and seen the quarterback get knocked flat on his back in a play and and one of the other players walked over to him and offer him his hand and, and, and help him back up. Well, that's what God does for us. First Peter chapter five, verse six says, humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. So who lifts us up when we get knocked down? God does. 
His mighty hand reaches down to help us get back on our feet. I'm sure you've seen the TV commercial where an elderly person has fallen and they say, help, I've fallen and I can't get up. Well, that's exactly what God is waiting on us to say. God, I can't do this on my own. In faith, I come to you knowing that you'll provide the lifting and you'll be my strength. But the important thing to remember here is that the Lord wants you to get back up. He wants you back in the game. He wants us as Christians and as the church back in the game. He wants us moving forward, not wallowing in defeat. The circumstances that knocked us down could very easily keep us down. But God made us to live by faith not circumstances or the things that we can see. He gives us purpose and hope beyond those circumstances. So you got to get back up. you got to live by faith. Throughout the Bible, we see God encouraging people to get up. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, there's a very powerful story there of King David dealing with grief. His baby was at the point of death and ultimately died. The prophet Nathan had warned David, that this child that came from his adulterous relationship with Bathsheba would die as punishment for David. And just as the prophet prophesied, the child got sick. And David pleaded with God. He fasted and he prayed. He flattened himself out on the ground, literally spent time on the ground. He had literally been knocked down. And even when his attendants tried to get him to eat or just to get up, he refused. And then the child died. And David's reaction surprised everybody. He got up, he bathed, he put on fresh clothes, and he ate. And most importantly, he worshiped God. Second Samuel chapter 12, beginning verse 21, says his attendants asked him, Why are you acting this way? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept. But now that the child is dead, you get up and eat. And he answered, While the child was still alive, I fasted and wept because I thought, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. But now that he is dead, why should I go on fasting? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. David was knocked down by grief, but he got up. He worshiped, and he continued his walk of faith, knowing that he would one day see his child again. David lived by faith. Sin and grief were not going to have the last word with him. So he got up with the help of the Lord and resumed his work as king. The prophet Elijah was knocked down by depression and self-pity. You remember that contest that he had with the prophets of Baal on Mount, uh, whatever the name of Mount was, it skips me right now. But when Jezebel found out that he had killed her pagan prophets, she determined to kill Elijah in revenge. What did he do? He ran for his life. And exhausted, he sat down under a tree and prayed that he would die. And exec fully exhausted, he eventually fell asleep. And God responded to Elijah's prayer. And he began the process of lifting him up again after he'd been knocked down. In fact, God sent his angel to help. He said in 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 5 through 9, All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some baked bread over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. And strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave and spent the night. God provided Elijah with food and strength at his lowest point in life and then he sent him an angel to tell him get up i'm not through with you yet there's still work to do and get back in the game and that's exactly what elijah did when you get knocked down god provides the lifting he even provides a nourishment but you have to decide to get back up jeremiah had a hard time getting the people of israel to listen to him they were a stubborn group, and they chose sin and rebellion over God time and time again. So God sent Jeremiah a basic message to give to the people. It was one that anybody could understand. In Jeremiah chapter 8, he says, Say to them, this is what the Lord says. When people fall down, do they not get up? 
When someone turns away, do they not return? Why then have these people turned away? Why does Jerusalem always turn away? God was frustrated with his people for wallowing in their sin and rebellion. They'd fallen down and they stayed down. They'd gone the wrong way and they were continuing down that wrong path. And, that's, and, that, and what God is saying is when you fall down or when you get knocked down, even if it's your own fault, when you sin and you did it willingly, then you've got to make a course correction. You've got to get up. You've got to seek the Lord again. And one very familiar story that Jesus told in Luke chapter 15, the story of the prodigal son, that wayward son wasted his life and money and wild living. We're familiar with the story. He ended up living with the pigs and eating pig food. And the Bible says he came to his senses. I like that. He came to himself. He came to his senses. And what he did, what did he do next? Verse 20 there in Luke 15 says, he got up and went to his father. He'd been knocked down by his own poor choices, but he didn't stay down. He got up and headed back to his father, which is a reference to God. All through the Bible are descriptions of people who are knocked down by various circumstances, and some of their own making. And the phrase that is used over and over and over again is get up, live by faith once again. Jesus told the paralyzed man after he healed him, get up and take your mat and go home. No more living in despair. Get up. In Mark chapter 5, or chapter 5, there's a story where Jesus heals the young girl. Actually, he raised her from the dead. And he reached out and took her by the hand and he said, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Several of Jesus' chosen disciples were caught by Jesus sleeping on the job. They had collapsed in exhaustion while Jesus was facing his most trying hour there in Gethsemane. And he said to them, when he found them, why are you sleeping? Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Saul was an enemy of the church, whose sole purpose seemed to be to knock down Christianity, to stop it at all costs. So he was arresting every Christian he could find. Acts says he was breathing out murderous threats against the church. I've told you before, it sounds to me, pictures in my mind, a dragon breathing out fire. But God had something else in mind for Paul, or Saul, at that time. And while he was in the very act of carrying out his plots against the church, Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus. He changed his name to Paul. He changed his purpose to being the greatest missionary the church has ever known. And here's what God said to Paul through Ananias. He said, what are you waiting for? Get up. Be baptized. Wash your sins away, calling on his name. Now you may be thinking right now, I've been knocked down, but I can't get up. I can't get up physically. I can't get up emotionally. I can't even get up spiritually. If that's the case, then it's time to worship and take your life before the throne of God and do as God says in the Bible in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. Cast all your cares on him, for he cares for you. And then you need to allow the Lord to lift you up beyond your circumstances Give your life purpose and meaning despite what you may see. Because remember, we live by faith and not by sight. Joni Erickson Tata grew up as most teenagers did in the 60s, living a very active life. She loved horseback riding. She played tennis. And one of her favorite activities was swimming. But on July the 30th, 1967, at the age of 17, she dove into some water, misjudged the depth, and as a result, she suffered a fracture in her spinal, spinal column, which left her paralyzed from the shoulders down. She was a quadriplegic. No use of her arms, no use of her legs. During the two years of rehabilitation that she went through, she experienced anger, depression, suicidal thoughts, and very serious religious doubts. But during her occupational therapy, she discovered a talent she had. She learned to paint with a brush that she held with her teeth and was even able to sell her artwork. She learned to write that way, too. Now I think she's moved to voice recognition software. It's a little easier. And to date, she's written over 40 books. She's recorded several musical albums. She's even starred in an autobiographical movie about her, her life. 
Today, she's an advocate for people with disabilities and speaks all across the country, sharing her faith in Christ. And to top it all off, she recently fought a battle with stage three breast cancer, undergoing radiation and chemotherapy before she was declared cancer free in 2015. I don't think there's any question that she knows what it's like to get knocked down. But after going through all that, she's gotten up in a big way and God has used her to influence millions of people to live by faith and not by sight. Let me share a few of her quotes from some of her books. She says, He has chosen not to heal me, but to hold me. And the more intense the pain, the closer the embrace. Another place she said, The best we can hope for in this life is a not whole peek at the shining realities ahead. And yet a glimpse is enough. It's enough to convince our hearts that whatever sufferings and sorrow currently assail us, they aren't worthy of comparison to that which waits over the horizon. Another of her quotes is, The weaker I am, the harder I must lean on God's grace. And the harder I lean on Him, the stronger I discover Him to be. And the bolder my testimony to His grace. And I like this last one I want to share with you. She said, faith isn't the ability to believe long and far into the misty future. It's simply taking God at his word and taking the next step. In other words, you got to get up. Take the next step spiritually first and then emotionally and physically if you can. But for every believer, I want you to know that your faith will one day be sight. You will see the glory of the Lord. You will see the face of Jesus. You will get up with his mighty power. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the arch archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And the Old Testament prophet Micah says, Though I have fallen, I will rise. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord will will be my light. As Christians, we will one day rise up. No matter what we may face today, whether it's sickness, whether it's financial problems, or even a worldwide pandemic, we live by faith, not by sight. And what we see around us can oftentimes be a burden that seems like no one can bear. But when we live by faith, there's an answer every time we get knocked down. You get up and you walk by faith. And if you can't physically get up, then you know this, that God will raise you up for his good purpose despite what you see. And ultimately, all of us will be raised to walk with him in our heavenly home. So get up and live boldly by faith.